Indian administration is the paper two in public administration. So, what are the areas of discussion uh, topics in the Indian administration? <laughs> so, basically, this deals with. Uh, most of the 80 percent of the syllabus is connected with the Indian polity. <coughs> Very few topics are outside the polity. If you study polity, it is useful for the Indian administration and it is a compulsory subject. Indian polity is a compulsory subject in the general studies part. And your study of Indian administration is useful for the uh, Indian polity also. So the concepts are also the same. And what are the areas of uh, study in the Indian administration? So we deal with the some uh, basics. And you, st uh, you read about the government. And you read about the administration in India. So in the basics category, you have historical background of Indian administration. So we need to know the historical background of the Indian administration right from the ancient period. Administration in the ancient medieval and the modern periods. So in the ancient period, we take the source from, we don't have to read the entire history. Historical background is not about the entire history, but it is only the basic uh, fundamental characteristics of his <coughs> historical background of the Indian administration. So from the ancient period, we have to take the source from uh, Kautilya Sardeshastra, <coughs> which is the basis for the Mauryan administration in the uh, earliest period. Then in the medieval period, we have to take the basis from uh, the Mughal administration, the source from the Mughal administration, but that too only from Akbar administrative characteristics. And uh, for the modern period, we have to take the source from the East India Company and British government administration. So the broad uh, features of the administration in the ancient, medieval and the modern periods should be understood. Then after that, uh, the constitutional background of Indian administration. So the constitutional background is provided by the philosophical basis of the Indian administration. The constitutional background means uh, how the constitution has provided the source for the Indian administration. And because uh, without the constitution, there is no administrative system in any democracy. Since India is a democracy, the administration in a democracy takes the source from the constitutional basis only. And that too from the, you, uh, you are supposed to read and by heart and analyze the preamble of the Indian constitution. Fundamentally, the examiner takes preamble of the Indian constitution as a fundamental source for asking the questions on this. And then uh, <coughs> you have to take uh, from the perspective of administration, administrative sources. So administrative sources, that is in what way that the administration is prioritized. And in the second category, we have to study about the governments, union government, then state governments, and the local government, including rural and urban governments. So this is all the uh, political side of the government, including that is all these three to be studied from the point of view of executive, then legislature and the judicial perspectives. So this uh, union government and state governments have to be studied with these dimensions. 
the executive in the union and the states legislature in the union and the states judiciary in the union and the states executive in the union means uh, the president prime minister and council of ministers at the state level uh, governor chief minister and the council of ministers legislature is parliament and the state legislative assembly then judiciary is the supreme court and the high courts so with those are uh, 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 dimensions this union government and the state governments have to be understood and all these things in the government and apart from this we should also know about the union state relations the relations between the union government and the state governments then in the administration part what are the things that you need to know is the secretariats in the at the union level and the state level and the directorates and the district administration see uh, you have union state and local government but there is no uh, there is also union administration and state administration and the district administration there is no district government at the district level what we have is only administration but not the government district administration is headed by the district collector so there is no political system in the district level so the from the political point of view we study in the government section about the union government state government and the local government but not the district government because there is no such thing as the district government what we have is only district administration so there is no political perspective in the district level only administrative perspective in the form of the district collector then uh, <coughs> you need to study about the land order administration <coughs> then financial administration then civil service administration and administrative reforms issues in indian administration there are all the dimensions within the third category the administration so these areas having uh, suppose this is uh, connected with these three areas are connected with the governance in the general studies and this is connected with the security management internal security issues in the general studies then this financial administration is related to the economy civil service in india is also connected with the governance in in the common papers then issues in the indian administration are connected both with uh say suppose polity and disaster management in the paper 3 so in the issues in the indian administration we have various topics a uh, half a dozen topics are there in the issues in the indian administration something like uh, issue of administration issues of administration in the coalition governments so what is the, what are the problems of administration in a coalition government which is connected with the related to the polity paper then disaster management is one of the topics to be studied as a part of the issues in indian administration and in the paper 3 of general studies you have the disaster management exclusively in paper 3 you study disaster management to the extent of 50 marks there are uh, while in in the indian administration one of the topics in the issues similarly the civil service in india having connection with the governance in the governance part in the general studies paper 2 uh, there is a topic called civil service in a democracy and in public administration second paper also we study about the civil service in india only the terminology is different that is civil service in india is mentioned in the 
public administration second paper and civil service in a democracy is mentioned in the jal studies paper 2 that is as a part of the government then financial administration see this, this is another uh, area of uh, one of the areas of compatibility between the public administration paper 1 and paper 2 in public administration paper 1 in the previous class we were discussing that we have to study about the pub, uh, financial administration and even in the indian administration also this financial administration should be studied which is connected with the budget accounting auditing and monetary policy fiscal policy role of finance ministry they are all studied as a part of common paper in the paper 3 that is the economy then law and order so in law and order you have a dedicated chapter in the second paper that is the police administration and in the general studies paper 3 internal security is one of the 50 marks area then secretary directorates and the, the uh, and also the district administration they are all studied as a part of the governance so across and these two are anyway related to the polity so that is historical background uh, the constitutional background of the indian constitution the indian administration in fact then administrative sources what are the various sources of administration so in addition to these things we also have other aspects like uh, planning and pub public enterprises so even these two aspects are also studied as a part of economy they are connected with the economy also so how do you deal with all these things how do you study these things and what is the source of understanding the Indian administration, which is largely connected with the Indian polity and governance. <clears throat> so basically the books to be referred for the Indian administration, first you have to study anyway along with the polity, uh, Indian polity by Lakshmi Kant is necessary. And that areas which are not covered here would be covered in the Indian governance in India. By Lakshmi Kant again. So there is another small book like governance and which covers various issues. Like, so suppose this part, first part and the second part. The basics and the government, they are all covered in the Indian polity. So while these topics like secretariat, district administration, law and order, financial administration, civil service in India, then administrative reforms, issue areas, then public enterprises, they are all covered in the governance in India. Very uh, Some basic concepts of all these things, administrative practices in India are covered as a part of this governance in India. And third, uh, you can read any book like uh, exclusively dedicated to Indian administration. Uh, by Fadia and Fadia. So it covers the entire syllabus, entire syllabus of Indian administration is being covered in this as a part of this particular book. Indian administration by Fadia and Fadia. So Indian polity, Lakshmi Kant, you have to study as a part of the general studies. Indian governance in India by Lakshmi Kant should also be studied because it is dealing with the governance part of the paper too uh, in the general studies. So that should not be considered as uh, a book related to public administration, need not be considered as a book related to public administration because it is an obligation. And Exclusively with reference to Indian administration, you have to study this because it covers all the uh, uh, syllabus, entire syllabus in a sequence from Fadia and Fadia. So these books will give you fundamental understanding of uh, the Indian administration system, the structure of the Indian administration. You can understand about the structure of the Indian administration. 
the what is this structure of the indian administration meaning how the administrative system is framed and that that is necessary to understand the indian administration both from the point of view of polity and governance and public administration second paper and beyond this you are also supposed to uh, analyze the things because fundamental concepts you can understand from these books suppose uh, president is the topic which we study as a part of both polity and as well as indian administration and the examiner can give a question here a question about this polity uh, president or election of the president so suppose in the polity section you may be given a question like the election of the president though di- indirect the president is representing the entire nation and the states commenter and though the election of the president is indirect the president is representing both the nation and the states so where you have to explain about you know the procedure of election of the president in what way the president is representing the nation and in what way the president is representing the states through this indirect election called proportional representation by means of a single transferable vote so the procedure of election should be mentioned over there and further there is also a possibility of asking a question the election of the new president is a symbol of new emer- uh, 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 new egalitarian perspective in the indian political system explain on it new egalitarian perspective in the indian society what is this new egalitarian perspective no? because so far the post of the president is being confined only to the elite communities the elite communities means the communities of the upper echelons in the society the higher levels in the society so only the people who are having background back supporting support from the ruling party and the people who are having the higher uh, uh, higher status in the society used to get elected as the president now the election of the president is representing altogether a new dimension in the indian social structure a person belonging to a tribal community and a person who is a tribal woman has got elected as a president it indicates the realism of the republic because we study about the republic and what is the republic republic means is a country in which the head of the state is elected so when it is when the head of the state is elected the meaning is everybody should have equal opportunities to get elected as the president head of the state but so far if you look at the history of the people who got elected as the president they all belong to the elite elite community in the societies and it is for the first time a person from the lowest stratum of the society got elected as the president so from that dimension how the republic in india is actually working out right from the grassroots level the real meaning of the republic is emerging from the right from the grassroots level so such question can be given and for the answer for which will not be there in the textbook this question may be given either in the paper 1 of general studies or in the paper 2 of gs or in the paper 2 of public administration across three papers i have suggested because the election of the president is having some uh, constitutional implication it may be asked in the paper 2 and the and the polity and it is a new sign of uh, a new lease of social social democracy in india a new lease of social democracy means having its social implications so therefore the same question can be asked even in the paper 1 of gs in the gs paper 1 what are the areas that you have is the role of women is one area and the social issues other social issues and social empowerment so either from the point of view of social empowerment or from the point of view of women empowerment this question can be given that the election of the new president as a lease a new lease of social equality from that dimension the question can be given even in the paper one also and then uh, so therefore the study of textbook is not adequate along with the textbook the indian polity lakshmikanth is not adequate 
but it is necessary you have to read it you have to study that without studying lakshmikant you cannot build the superstructure this is the foundation lakshmikant book is the foundation and without studying that you cannot build the structure on that so uh, it will not be possible to answer the questions either in the polity or in the society or in the indian administration without studying lakshmikant both polity and the governance and at the same time they are not adequate so it is necessary but not adequate then what else is required so you have to read various articles from the newspapers so either you can, either you should read from the indian express explainer so or otherwise you can also read from the hindu paper articles related to the various topics in the syllabus so therefore it is necessary for you to by heart the syllabus first by heart the entire syllabus in the public administration or in the general studies also so that you will be in a position to understand the compatibility between gs and public administration so if you could able to recognize this compatibility between the gs and the public administration your burden of preparation will be drastically reduced burden of preparation because additionally you don't have to read for 500 marks for the optional your fundamental preparation of the general studies itself is also compatible to you know public administration as an optional the only thing that you have to do is you have to be thorough with the theories in public administration so when you are thorough with the theories in public administration hardly you will have around 7 units in the public administration theory in the paper one theory oriented scholastic oriented subject is only 7 chapters in the paper one and remaining 5 units in the paper one and 14 units in the paper two they are all connected with the general studies only they are related to compatible with the general studies and the theory oriented subject is also useful to ethics paper suppose in ethics you have 125 marks part of you know case studies you can present a better answer for the case study when you are thorough with the theories in public administration because the case studies in ethics part are connected with the administrative issues right and if an administrator is facing a particular ethical dilemma how an administrator will overcome that ethical dilemma will be the crux of the question in any question in any part related to the case studies so the solution to all these case studies the uh, the answer to all these case studies can be better provided when you take the source from the ideas given by various administrative scholars so suppose the ethical dilemmas arises when there is a conflict situation in the ethics paper usually you face the ethical dilemmas in relation to what you call the case studies every ethical dilemma every case study is connected with a conflict conflict between people who are working in the administrative scenario conflict between boss and the subordinate conflict between political executive and the bureaucrat the minister and the bureaucrat conflict between the people and the administration conflict between the political executive and the people so any kind of conflict will be possible conflict between the police and the accused so these conflicts would be better understood when you understand about the conflict management in the theories of administration there is a topic on the conflict management in the theories of administration the ideas to be derived from mp follett an administrative scholar a management scholar mp follett she has provided a theory of conflict management in detail in a, which are which were proposed in the early 1920s the concepts she proposed in the early 1920s are still relevant even after a century that was it is almost more than 100 years ever since she has proposed this idea of conflict management and this conflict management is still having its relevance even today in the modern organizations also so therefore these uh, theories that you have study as a part of you no know, uh, public administration paper one would be useful even for the answering for answering the case studies in the ethics paper so entire syllabus in public administration 
both in the paper 1 and paper 2 having its relevance to any one of the topics in the general studies completely so you cannot ignore any topic in the public administration and every uh, topic in public administration having its relevance to every topic in the general studies there will be connectivity there is a connectivity across any paper any topic in the general studies so when you are preparing for this 500 marks you are not preparing exclusively or only for that particular chapter because administration means anything that is to be done by the whatever that is being done by the administrator and as a civil servant you are appearing for a post related to the administration as a civil servant the civil servant means a servant of the citizen and what you do as a civil servant is administration and as an administrator whatever you do is connected with the uh, administration everything that is done by the civil servant and everything that is not by done by the civil servant is administration whatever you do and whatever you don't do everything is related to administration only so because suppose for example you have to make a decision and what is the best decision even this decision making process is also discussed as a part of the administration public administration paper one and it is said that what is the best decision a best decision is a decision not to make a decision because every time you cannot make the decision you should not make the decision sometimes you have to leave the situation without deciding it so the best decision could be a decision not to decide a taking a decision not to decide is also a decision and such kind of approach is uh, has been adopted suppose for adopted by the prime ministers like pv narasimha rao several times pv narasimha rao used to leave the things alone without making a decision without taking the action the issues used to get settled by themselves and we, but you have to be in a position to identify which situations are the right situations to be decided which situations are the right situations not to be decided and the same is the case with even prime minister manmohan singh also even manmohan singh also used to leave the things alone without making a decision and such inaction in certain circumstances would be more fruitful than taking a hurried action so one has to know and recognize what are the areas of taking the decision and what are the areas of not taking a decision so therefore the best decision is not making a decision but the best decision is identifying the conditions in which you should not make a decision a decision not to decide is the best decision always so suppose uh, if you have to fight a battle if you have to fight a battle with a very bigger enemy in that situation you have to take a decision not to fight a battle otherwise it takes its toll and the troll will be heavier which you cannot bear something like the example is from uh, russia and ukraine the enemy is very huge and ukraine is a very small country and of course it is uh, 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 taking the action very toughly with the support from other countries so the best decision would have been a decision not to fight or a decision to enter into a treaty rather than fighting with an enemy so it is taking its toll when the when you have made a decision to fight it out it is taking its toll so therefore many a times a strategic decision or a good decision is the one where you have decided not to take a decision leaving the things alone the issues will get settled by themselves and this is the situation where the pub, uh, public administration would be giving you certain insights into how you have to manage the things how to how you get the things done and getting things done is nothing but the public administration so every aspect related to public administration are connected with these aspects only so right from the union government level to the state government and local government district administration level so in the uh, we start the public administration uh, second paper with reference to the constitutional and historical background historical and constitutional background will give you the insights related to the source of indian administration 
because we cannot understand the contemporary administrative practices without understanding the source, the roots of the administration. Because suppose today we have almost 80% of Indian administration is based on the foreign administration, only, a colonial legacy. People will be talking and criticizing about the colonial legacy, but we cannot avoid the colonial legacy in the Indian administration. That colonial legacy has to be understood from the historical background. So the questions in the exam will be asked uh, based on the comparison, comparison of the past with the present. You need to know about the historical background of Indian administration because you have to make a comparison of the past with the present. And what is this comparison of the past with the present? Comparison of uh, Kautilya Sardha Shastra with the present day administration. Or the minute details will be taken as a basis for the comparison. Minute details is not necessarily very minute. Something like comparison of the financial management in the Ardha Shastra with the present financial administration. Comparison of civil service during the ancient period with the present day civil service system. Comparison of district administration during the British rule with the present day British uh, district administration. So because the district administration, police administration or uh, the law and order administration, they are all the uh, legacies of the British. So those comparative elements will be asked either ancient to the present, medieval to the present, or modern to the present, modern administration based on the British administration. And otherwise, uh, the important question for this year would be like a district collector. The 250 years of district collector and history of the 250 years of district collector, the evolution of the district collector can be the question. Because the post of district collector was established in 1772. And this is the 2022 is the 250th year of the establishment of the, the post of district collector. So during this 250 years of period, how the collector post got evolved? This may be a possible question. So do you think that there is a need for abolition of the post of district collector? Can be a question. Or otherwise, the, the nomenclature district collector need not be continued in the present day. Or do you agree? Can be a question. The nomenclature is the name. The name district collector need not be continued in the present day because the district collector is no more a collector. Because the post of the district collector was established to collect revenue, land revenue. But today, no state is collecting the land revenue. So when the states are not collecting the land revenue, the name district collector need not be continued. He is not collecting anything. The district collector is more of district administrator rather than district collector. So the need for changing the nomenclature of the district collector can be a question in the context of the 250th year of the foundation of the post of collector. So examiner can also get influenced by the recent incidents, the landmark events and the issues that were in the news, the burning topics that are in the news. So. So for first you have to study, we have to study about that historical background followed by the concepts related to the constitutional background. After the British government, we have formulated our own constitution and this constitution is the foundation for the Indian, the Indian administration. So how the Indian administration is, in, is taking the inspiration from the constitution of India? What are the constitutional values? that are the foundation for the Indian administration. The constitutional values are like it's a sovereign state, socialist, secular, democratic, and it's a republic. And most probably, for example, this year, a question may be asked about the republic nature of the Indian administration. Why the republic nature of the Indian administration would be asked as the question is because of the election of the president. A person who came from a very sober background, a very moderate background and from the grassroots level. From grassroots level, she has reached the level of the president. From the grassroots level in the sense when in 1997, after completing her job as a, a teacher of a school, she joined BJP. And within three years, that, that was in 2000, in the year 2000, she got elected as a Sarpanch. 
they, from sarpanch level she has reached the level of you know the president head of the state so that indicates how the republic is elevating the people giving the opportunities to the people to elevate themselves from the grassroots level to the highest level in the indian political system on those lines the question can be given and after this constitutional dimension then we have to move to the administration a government dimension that is the political side in the political side you will be given questions from the union government state government union government legislature executive judiciary and the state government also based on those things so the probable questions this time will be about the go governor of the state because the union government and the state governments are keeping the institution of the governor always in the news union government is using the governor as an agent state governments are criticizing the governor for acting against their interest and the state governments are also went to the have also gone to the extent of demanding for the abolition of the post of governor the chief ministers like uh, tamil nadu chief minister kerala chief minister west bengal chief minister they have all demanded the union government to abolish the post of governor so in this context uh, uh, there may be a probable question on the post of the governor the direct question can be given do you think that there is a need for abolition of the post of governor do you think that the same question can also be given in the gs also do you think that the, there is a need for abolition of the post of the governor in the context of growing demand for the abolition of the post of governor conflict between the cm and the governors is also on the verge of increase almost in 12 states where the bjp is not ruling in 12 states the governors have become the bone of contention between the cm and the governor and even in telangana also we can see how the governor is taking the political records of action against the government which is, which he should not and is not expected to perform such things something like uh, she made a comment about she made, she tweeted about the chief minister as a governor she should not make any comments about the politics governor is beyond the politics in all the in the context of all these developments in the country about the role of the governor across the country not just in ap and telangana across the country the post of governor is very controversial and therefore the examiner can give you a question about the governor's post and this is the way in which you have to guess the questions and if something when you by heart the syllabus topics subtopics in the syllabus you will be in a position to identify the areas of importance because when you know that there is a topic of governor in the syllabus under the state government then when you see a news item or an editorial written on the post of the governor you will immediately note down some points based on that why the governor's post is in the news based on that analysis you would be in a position to understand how the question can be given so that is how the uh, possibility of guessing the question is like a judicial review is another area of significance in the recent times in the last one or two years that the court the supreme court has emerged very active taking the cases sumoto during the 2020 uh, second wave of uh, corona virus the govern the supreme court has taken a series of cases sumoto what is this sumoto cases sumoto cases means appealing a case in the supreme court without being appealed by someone the judges will take the cases by themselves based on the news in the media the news in the media will be the source of taking the cases by the court and when the court takes the cases by itself without being appealed by anybody and that is called as a sumoto case and that is the biggest event of uh, you know judicial activism and the court is continuously criticizing and censuring the government what is censuring the government finding fault with the government action and almost every day the government is being censured by the court even in the yesterday's newspaper also there is a news about the judiciary and what is the news it has issued notif notices to the central government and the state governments about what they are doing to deal with the freebies because every political party offers freebies 
and there was a person called ashwini kumar upadhyay who is known for filing the public interest litigations in the supreme court almost every day he files a public interest litigation and so far he has filed more than 1000 public interest litigations in the supreme court and he filed a uh, case in the supreme court seeking guidelines to the government about the freebies offered by the political parties what is a freebie that is a political party promising something free to the people it earlier it used to be till 2010 uh, uh, first decade of the 21st century the political parties used to promise only the goods free goods now the governments are promising particularly the state governments are promising free money the free transfer of money so suppose in telangana the government is offered the government has offered 10 lakhs rupees per family particularly the people belonging to the, the scheduled caste and the government has named it as dalit bandhu it's a just free transfer of money for everybody who is a scheduled caste person the most absurd program in the world not just in india most absurd program in the world why it is absurd program in the world because no other government in the world is giving so much amount of money to the people no government in the world is transferring so much amount of money in the world even during the lockdown period the most developed country like america has also only transferred 2000 dollars for the people affected by the covid 19 during the covid period but the government in telangana has promised uh, is transferring 10 lakhs rupees per family and there is no rationality in this program why there is no rationality in this program because everybody who is sc would be offered 10 lakhs rupees for every family irrespective of the background this transfer of money is not only for the poor scheduled caste it should have been confined only to the poor scheduled caste people suppose if there is an ias officer and is an sc an sc ias officer is also given 10 lakhs rupees under the dalit bandhu scheme and if there is a minister and belong to the sc category will be transferred you know uh, 10 lakhs rupees something like raitu bandhu only in the raitu bandhu scheme the farmers are offered 6 6000 rupees and everybody who is having an acre land would be transferred 6000 rupees per acre suppose chiranjeevi has 20 acre land in a uh, 20 acre farm land in uh, uh, in the outskirts of of the hyderabad and even chiranjeevi is also given this money for this 20 acre land so 20 acres into 6000 will be transferred because he is a farmer why he is a farmer because he has farm land to the extent of 20 acre everybody will be transferred with the money so uh, in the andhra pradesh the number of freebies are much more and in this context whether transferring the money is right or wrong may be a question from the judicial point of view either in the paper 1 uh, general studies this question can be given or in the paper 2 of polity or in the paper 4 or in the paper 3 as well in the paper 3 you have economy section in the economy section there is a topic on budget out of the 10 units in the economy either in as a part of the budget government budgeting or as a part of the inclusive governance including inclusive development this question related to the freebies may be given as a question or even in the ethics paper also this question can be given either as a case study or as a descriptive question how far it is ethical to offer freebies to the people and where is the moral perspective in the freebies the moral perspective is they are promising are you keeping your promise the general perspective among the people is people generally think that political parties will make the promises and will they keep up their promises they do generally what we think is they do not but reality is they do how they do 
keep up their promise. What the promise is, if I come to the power, I will give you 10 lakhs rupees. Just like Janasena party in Andhra Pradesh is promising the people. The Janasena party is promising the people saying that every young person, young unemployed person in the, in the state would be given 10 lakhs rupees. Just like the Dalit Bandhu scheme. Another promise is, made, is, on the, is in the pipeline. Every unemployed youth will be given 10 lakhs rupees. Just if you are registered as an unemployed person, you will be given 10 lakhs, that's all. No strings, no rules, no conditions attached. And what is the definition of youth? And what is the definition of unemployment? That has to be done. Suppose there are 4 crores to 5 crore people in Andhra Pradesh. And if there are 1 crore young population who are unemployed, suppose, then how much money you have to give the, uh, how much money that you have to give to them? 1 crore into 10 lakhs. And how much it is? 1 crore into 10 lakhs. Uh, not even imaginable. And what is the budget of the Andhra Pradesh state? The state budget is not more than 1 lakh crores. So, but the promise is beyond this. And how you fulfill this promise? Where you have to define everything. It is same like free power was offered by Vice Raj Shekhar Reddy in 2004. When they were promising free power, there were no strings attached, no rules, no conditions. But once they came into the power, they have created the conditions. Free power will be offered only to the farmers. People thought during the election promises, free power will be offered to all the people. People started thinking that nobody has to pay the current bill. But once they came to the power, then they have created this condition saying that free power is offered only to the farmers. Second condition, free power is given only to the farmers having a pump set. Third condition, after a few days, free power will be given only between 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. The meaning you have to wake up at 4, 2 a.m. to switch on this you know, pump set. So these are the conditions, new conditions as the promises as actually to be implemented. Similarly, if Janasena comes to power, they will say that we give you money if you are an unemployed person. That is the first condition anyway. And who is an unemployed person? An employed person can be anybody who is not having a productive ability to do the work. Ready to do the work, but has no work to do. So then what the government will do? The government will start giving jobs to everybody. Either in the private sector or in the government sector. Directly or indirectly, the government will engage everybody in the jobs. Then still if you don't have a job, then only you will be given money. We are ready to give you a job. If you are not ready to do the job, then there is no question of giving the money. And according to your qualification, either you have to work as a, an NREGP worker or you have to work in any of the government or private operated companies. Their government will show the vacancies first. When the government shows the vacancies, they have to go for work, irrespective of their qualification level. Suppose if you are a graduate, and even as a graduate, you may be given NREGP work. What is NREGP work? You have to work in the rural areas and you have to work, deal with, uh, work with the mud. Mud related activities have to be performed. And you are not doing your agriculture work only. And how you do the NREGP work? So the people will be reluctant to do the jobs. So since you are reluctant to do, to do the job, we are not giving you the money. We offer some job and you have to do that job. So they twist what they have promised. They are not breaking their promises. They are twisting their promises. And still, second point, political parties are not breaking their pro promises. What they are promising is uh, we give you 10 lakhs rupees when we come to the power. Suppose if Janasena did not come to the power, what happens? 
it cannot fulfill the promise. So had it broken its promise? No, it is not breaking the promise. If it comes to the power, it will fulfill the promise. Suppose Vyas Jagan Mohan Reddy during the election campaign promised Navratnas. Did the Navratnas promise fil- fulfilled or not? Did the Navratna promise fulfilled or not? Definitely they were all implemented to the extent of 90%. All of the promises have been implemented. Only to the extent of 10% only they could not be done. And in the remaining period that would be done. So generally what the political parties promises is being kept up. The promise kept. So this dimension of the freebies, moral principle, moral perspective of the freebies may be asked in the ethics paper. And uh, in polity and governance, in what way it is asked? The question in the polity and governance may be asked from the point of view of whether these freebies are good or bad. You cannot declare every freebie as a bad thing. Generally, people would be worried about freebies offered by the government. And they say that Andhra Pradesh and Telangana are going to become Sri Lanka. So how it is possible that AP and Telangana can become a Sri Lanka? It is impossible because Sri Lanka has borrowed from China. Whereas Telangana has borrowed from? Did Telangana borrow from China? Oh. Are Andhra Pradesh borrowed from China? And India, lo, the highest uh, borrowings were borrowed by state of Telang- Tamil Nadu. Almost 6 lakh crore they have borrowed from various sources. And out of this 6 lakh crore, loan borrowed by Tamil Nadu government, highest loan in the country among all the states. From where they have borrowed this money? They have not borrowed from China or Russia or America. They borrowed from Neither they have borrowed from World Bank or the IMF. They borrowed from either Union Government or from the RBI or from various commercial banks or they raised money from in the form of uh, the, the public revenues. So they borrowed from the general public. So but not from, an, from abroad. So there is no question of AP and Telangana becoming the Sri Lanka. It is impossible that AP and Telangana will become Sri Lanka. If required, AP and Telangana, if they are completely in the uh, debt trap, then the union government may impose a financial emergency in these states and they save that. If the financial emergency is imposed, a financial emergency can be imposed not only across the country. Financial emergency can also be imposed in any one particular state also. Not necessarily in the entire country. In any single state as well, the financial emergency can be enforced. So by imposing the financial emergency in AP, the union government can save the state. Before imposing the financial emergency in AP, the union government will give several bailout packages. So nothing can happen, nothing will happen and moreover AP and Telangana are not so much in danger of a debt trap like Tamil Nadu and other states. Before Andhra Pradesh, if the central government has to impose the financial emergency, before AP and Telangana, they have to impose financial emergency in nine states. AP and Telangana are in the 10th and 11th positions among the states which have borrowed the money from various states, from the union government or the RBI. So the article 293 of the Indian constitution is prohibiting the states from borrowing from abroad. Because the framers of the constitution know that if the states are allowed to borrow from abroad, they will transform the state into a financially crisis hit nation like Fran- uh, Sri Lanka or Venezuela. And that would not be possible in India because of Article 293. So therefore, every freebie is not necessarily bad. People will be thinking only from this negative perspective. But there is good from the freebies. Suppose when in Andhra Pradesh, in joint Andhra Pradesh, midday meal scheme was introduced for the first time in the country by N.T. Ramaro government. Midday meal scheme. Now what is this midday meal scheme? That the children in the schools will be feeded free of cost. And in the beginning, opposition people thought that 
it is a waste of time it is a waste of money and a waste of energy but that is one of the reasons for increased literacy and education levels in the country when children are feeded in the afternoon in the schools parents are interested to send their children to the schools similarly when nt ramarao as the chief minister introduced this 2 rupees kg kg rice everybody has thought that it is a waste of money it's an irrational program but today there is no state which is not offering 2 rupees kg per rice so every state either offering the rice or offering the wheat even union government is also implementing this program though public distribution system is a state level program union government in the pro- through the programs like annapurna there is a scheme called annapurna and under the scheme senior citizens are provided 10 kg of rice or 10 kg of wheat at 2 rupees if it is rice 3 rupees if it is wheat for the senior citizens who are above the age of 60 years dedicatedly 10 kg will be given to them which is useful which is adequate for them to eat for the entire month because how many kg of rice we eat per day per head 10 kg would be adequate for the senior citizens can you eat 1 kg per rice per day or 1 kg wheat per day impossible maximum we eat 200 grams maximum counting together all the uh, four meals four meals a day a breakfast idli require rice and afternoon lunch require rice rice and evening s- snacks also require rice and night dinner requires rice rice or wheat depending upon where you are staying and living in it so even this offering of rice at a subsidized price was also considered by the people and the opposition as a waste of money but it is not necessarily as that so you have to think suppose in there are six programs in andhra pradesh related to exclusively related to development of education suppose nadu redu is one such scheme which is concerned with the uh, face lifting of the scheme, schools that is providing the infrastructure facilities in the schools and is it necessary that infrastructure development is required for the schools definitely necessary because even good infrastructure will also attract the students to the extent of 20% and there is another program called jagananna gormuda and uh, amma wadi scheme all these schemes are intended to promote the education in the amma wadi scheme the government is transferring 15000 rupees per month to the mothers who are sending their children to the schools which school they have to send government school or private school either they can send either to whether they are sending children to the private school or government school doesn't bother if they are sending the children to the school that is the matter so there are three other programs for the development of higher education something like fee, fee reimbursement program for the people who are pursuing the higher education uh, there are six schemes do we consider these six schemes for the development of the education as a freebies as a waste of money they are all investment in the human resources they are not uh, the unproductive work the product would be visible after 10 years it takes minimum 10 years to see the actual productivity of these schemes so because from this point of view the question may be given how far these freebies offered by the politicians are uh, actually f- uh, fruitful they are fruitful to their some extent and they are not necessarily fruitful to some other extent because every freebie is not necessarily productive every freebie is not necessarily unproductive also the education schemes are productive and any other schemes so uh, for the auto drivers 10000 rupees are transferred every year the government is transferring 10000 rupees to the auto drivers which is not necessary 10000 rupees they can earn in a month and maximum they can earn this 10000 rupees in a week 
so such kind of transfer of money just because you have to formally transfer the money you are transferring it and from that dimension judiciary related questions can be given then in the administrative point of view the areas related to the secretariat directorate they are the static aspects then district administration is also static aspect i told you what type of question can be given for the district administration uh, taking the uh, landmark year of the establishment of the post of district collector a question can be given on those lines that the evolution of the district collector during the last 250 years how the nature of district collector is changing over a period of time the transformation of the role of the collector during the east india company during the british crown crown rule and after the independence since 1990s after independence the role of the collector has changed and the role of the collector further changed after 1990s and with the turn of the new millennium there is a further change in the role of the collector after 1990s is because of introduction of the panchayat raj system with a constitutional status by the 73rd amendment in 1992 and the 73rd amendment in the panchayat raj system has also changed the role of the collector now what happened with this 73rd amendment every state is supposed to establish the local governments panchayat raj institutions with which developmental role of the collector is being transferred to the panchayat raj institutions usually we say that we are told that the collector is becoming more and more powerful every time the collector is getting more powers but the collector is actually getting more responsibilities not the powers the role of the collector is becoming more burdensome rather than becoming more powerful so how the role of the collector is becoming more burdensome because if there is something that is not related to be performed by any other officer would be given to the collector to be performed something like dalit bandhu scheme dalit bandhu scheme is a new scheme and it is not being implemented by any particular department so who is responsible for its implementation is the district collector any new work initiated by the government is supposed to be implemented by the collector he is taking more responsibilities but there is no equal number of powers to uh, uh, to perform these responsibilities so role of collector is actually becoming more and more declined but people in general thinking that the collector is becoming more powerful so such kind of question can be given and similarly in the law and order administration law and order administration is based on the indian police act 1861 so in the background of this 1861 indian police act questions can be given so it is over uh, 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 how the indian police administration should be reformed that the indian police administration should be reformed beyond the colonial legacy because entire administrative police structure is based on the british practice room. in fact when the police structure if you look at the police structure it start with the constable and this constable system coming from the mughal period not even from the british east india company administration constabulary was first introduced by the brit mughals then it is borrowed by the british government then we are continuing this constabulary then there is sub inspector circle inspector and the finally you have dgp at the top what kind of reforms should be brought in in the structure of the police administration because this has been a demand for a long time to bring reforms in the police administration because the police are misusing their powers police are restricted with their powers there are two things that the police are having today two issues one is police have restricted authority quite opposite to that police are misusing their authority two things are there police have restricted authority restricted powers because of the political influences because of the pressure group politics pressure group politics means various pressure groups are operating caste groups religious groups linguistic groups so these pressure groups are influencing the police and they are restricting the police from enjoying their power and uh, 
there are also informal pressures on the police restricting the powers of the police informal pressure means a local politician or a local locally influential person will influence the police from doing their job there is something suppose uh, a day before yesterday i happened to see a video where akunuri murali a retired ias officer is visiting kaleshwaram project when he was visiting the kaleshwaram project and the police have stopped him when police says not to visit that place how you will respond how do you respond as an ordinary person suppose if you are an ordinary person you will follow that but this person akunuri murali is actually quarreling with the police so of course uh, what uh, the background of akunuri murali is different he is an ias officer but not now the informal influence that he is using is pressurizing the police and the policeman is actually requesting him and almost touching his feet that please do not visit that place but that is in the interest not of the politics it is in the interest of his obstructing this person in the interest of that individual only because this project is overflowing if you are visiting that place for any reason either for the interest of the people or for the interest of something else it is overflowing and if you visit that place he may be pulled down by the flowing flood so then who will be criticized then police would be criticized suppose if you are riding a bike if you if you are triple riding a bike police would try to stop you when police tries to stop you what we have to do we have to stop and you will skip the police and will jump the police and what the police will do then the police will throw the lathi on you and you will fall on the divider and your head is broken and suppose if you die and newspapers would criticize whom the indisciplined citizen you are indisciplined in two two dimensions one is you are riding a triple triple ride and second indiscipline is you have not stopped when the police ask you to stop two things that you have shown in discipline you broken the law therefore you are an indisciplined citizen and the the media will criticize the police so this is where the police would be under the pressure their role is being restricted by various informal things political executive will restrict the local influential persons will will restrict the informal influences will restrict the police from doing the things that is one one aspect the opposite dimension of this is police is usually misusing their powers they are committing the lottery charges they are killing the people in the encounters killing the people in the encounters is the biggest misuse of the manipulation of the power that they have and third killing the people in the lockup which is generally called as a lockup death they are all the manipulation and misusing the powers so in this contradictory things how the police have to work policing in india is not merely a matter of law and order if it is a matter of law and order you can maintain it with guns you can maintain it with lattes you can maintain it with water cannons and you can maintain it with uh, laughing gas so there are all the instruments but law and order in india is not merely uh, a matter of public order or it is a matter of te- technology in india police administration is a matter of socio economic issue it is a matter of social economic and political issues people who usually violate the law and order is having a different social background people who usually recourse to the public order crimes will have a different background public order crime means a crime committed by a terrorist is a public order crime a terrorism incident an incident of naxalism they are the public order related and who usually become the naxalites those who are very poor people people from the very poor background will become the naxalite does the son of reliance ambani becomes a naxalite can you imagine at least you can't even imagine that 
Ambani's son will become an excellent. Because he is a very rich person and he don't have to fight for anybody. And he don't have to fight for himself also. Because everything is ready for him and he has to work for the sustenance of what he has. Therefore, if you look at the background of the people who are Naxalites, they are all poor people. And dealing with the Naxalism, handling with the Naxalism will require not law and order management tactics, but it will require socio-economic and political solution. You cannot eradicate the Naxalism with the guns. You cannot eradicate the Naxalism with the robots. Because the Naxalites are the human beings and they are fighting for the human cause. When you are fighting for the human cause, the roots of the Naxalism will be very deep. And if you have to root out these deep roots of the Naxalism, you have to handle this with social economic solutions, but not technical solutions. Technical solutions means something like using a drone or using a gun. That will not provide the solution. It would require altogether a different dimension approach. So that would actually will provide a permanent solution. Naxalism originated in which state? In which state Naxalism for the first time has emerged? Uh, West Bengal. In West Bengal there is a place called, what is that? Naxalbury. After the name Naxalbury, the people who are requesting to this movement called Naxalism are known as the Naxalites. In 1969 there was the first event of the Naxalism in West Bengal, Naxalbury village. And in just a span of five years, they have eradicated Naxalism from West Bengal. How they could able to do this? Not with the police, but with the socio-economic measures. What are the socio-economic measures they have taken is implementation of the land reforms. What is the implementation of land reforms? Providing land to everybody. Redistributing the land to land and wealth to all the people. When you redistribute the land to all the people, everybody will become a rich. A landless person is given a acre land. What happens? This poor man will become richer by one acre land. When you are richer by one acre land, you will be engaged and you are busy with tilling the land. You are not interested to fighting for the people in the name of Naxalism. So in just a span of five years, by 1974, they have eradicated the Naxalism from the state of West Bengal. And then it spread to other states where the people are still marginalized, where the people are exploited, where the people are not, are ignored by the government completely. Particularly the tribal people are ignored by the governments. So in these places, the, the Naxalites have spread, exploiting the poverty of the people. Therefore, in 18 states, there is Naxalism at present. And the governments in these states are dealing the Naxalism only as a land order problem, but not as a socio-economic problem. So all these aspects should be understood as a part of the land order concepts. So we continue in the next class and our next class would be on Monday, not tomorrow and Saturday. Our next class would be on Monday.